Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139. State Representative Sandy Pope of Mount Horeb is a Democrat seeking re-election in the 80th Assembly District. The primary is August 11th. Sandy, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Well, thank you. It's been a while. You know, uh, my question for incumbent legislators, if they're back in the legislature, top priority for the next session, please. Oh, wow. There are so many to choose from, Steve. Pick one. Just pick one. Oh, all right, well, I'm going to have to choose COVID because it's right here every day, everywhere. Um, the news just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And I, I can't imagine that the legislature doesn't have to come back and help find ways to make this livable for people in terms of the economy and their health and access to whatever resources we can wrangle up for them from federals and from our own. It's, it's going to be trouble. Well, let's 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 pursue that a bit. Um, you were in the legislature in the assembly for the Great Recession. It was a tough time balancing the budget. You remember that. If the governor's right, and this time we're two billion with a B short in general fund tax collections, do we cut spending or do we raise taxes and fees? Drawing on your experience, I I don't think you're going to get one or the other. I think you're going to get a mixture of both. Um, and by January, when we start putting that budget together, who knows what position we're going to be in, but we're certainly going to need money. Um, yes, we have to be open to all of this. I am not one of those folks who signed a no tax pledge under any circumstances. So mm -hmm. I am open to that thought. Um, none of us, none of us want to raise taxes. However, in you know unusual times in emergency situations, we may have to. We're also gonna to have to cut. I can't imagine that cuts aren't gonna be taken on every level. Including K-12 when they've got such tremendous additional costs dealing with COVID and social distancing and all these difficult choices that our K-12 parents and administrators are making right now and teachers? Well, don't gore my bull. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. You're a former chair of Assembly Ed. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you, you did bring up a great point. Uh, what is more important than educating our kids? And what is more important than doing that safely? And boy, I feel bad for superintendents and school boards right now having to make decisions about opening school in the safest way possible, not only for the students, but for those teachers who are coming back and the support staff and the bus drivers and, and all of them. Um, I've been talking to my superintendents and I'm really pretty impressed with the variety of ways that they're managing this problem and still trying to retain the fluidity that they're gonna need depending on what condition they're in. I mean, who knows if we're still even gonna be open as a state by then. I watch what's happening in Florida and Texas and I think who's next? I mean, we've just, I'm really pleased that Dane County has a mask order right now. Um, I see far too many people wandering around without much concern or any concern about spreading that virus or getting that virus. Let's stay on pandemic. Um, we've seen how hospitals are on the front lines of dealing with that in Wisconsin and across the nation. Yeah, as you said, it squeezes revenues, it squeezes demands on healthcare systems. When, if you're reelected and voting on the next budget, hospitals deserve an even greater priority than they may have in the current budget, Sandy? Oh, absolutely. Do you want your life saved? Um, you know, <laughs> there's, there's a point at which it actually means the difference between life and death. And we can't let our hospitals be there without enough equipment and staff to meet the need, but we don't know what the need is at the moment. If we are smart, and if we keep that virus at our borders and away from us, then it's gonna be less of a problem. But sometimes I, I don't have a ton of confidence in us acting in the best way possible. Understand, a follow-up question. Um, if a business follows all the CDC 
our WEDC guidelines to protect its employees and customers, should they be Im immune from fr fr frivolous lawsuits? Well, that's not a black and white answer. Um, I want to say yes, because frivolous lawsuits should be, you know, and everybody should be immune from those. However, look at what happened in the meatpacking plants when they were forced to go back in order to keep their jobs. And yet huge numbers of them, you know, had the virus, were working next to people who had the virus and they knew they were gonna get it. They knew they had it. And yet they were forced to go back. That's a different situation than a school with limited resources doing everything possible to maintain the highest safety standards they can. And then the next question of course is how do you prove this? <laughs> I mean, a meat packing plant where everybody's got the virus, yes, that's a different situation than I've picked up the virus and I think I got it at such and such a place. How are you gonna prove that? So, right. yeah. Okay. No, uh, no, no black and white answer for you, Steve. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Uh, new subject. Um, the Constitution says a party in power should draw the next congressional legislative lines, but I've inter interviewed you on this subject before. You, you back the governor's People's Commission idea. Why? Because that's what the people want. Huge numbers of people want it. I have received endless resolutions from municipalities calling for us to do this differently. Um, it's pretty obvious who doesn't want to do this. And as the legislator who was there when lines were drawn before, I can tell you it needs to be done fairly. Um, it's just an atrocity that Wisconsin is probably the worst in the nation in terms of gerrymandering. Uh, I look at the makeup of the people in my chamber, for example, the 63 Republicans and the 36 of us, we had more votes than they did collectively in terms of popular votes, who wants us in the assembly chambers. The Democrats won that one. How, how does that make any sense? Um, people's voices are being silenced by those people who are drawing maps and it needs to be fair, it needs to be honest. The public needs to have confidence that when they go to the ballot box and cast a ballot, it's going to count for something. Uh, uh new subject. The landscape on marijuana changes uh, annually. Now, now that Illinois has legalized rec recreational marijuana, what's your position on both medical and recreational? I have always been in support of medical marijuana. Um, there was never a time when I didn't. And Steve, I'm telling you this as maybe the only human being you know who has never tried marijuana ever in any form. Um, recreational, yes. When we've got Illinois sitting next door and people are using it, buying it anyway, then let's take advantage of the tax opportunity and let's not, let's not be putting people in prison, in jail for possession when so many people are already using it anyway. And do I see it as a gateway? No, not really. I think alcohol is far worse in terms of what it does to families and individuals and bodies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Americans know a lot more about how some police officers treat those in custody than we did three months ago. The governor's nine bill special session package uh, ban choco, ban chokeholds, uh, no knock warrants, uniform training standards for police. Do you support the governor's package or do you think it doesn't go far enough? I absolutely do support it. And I, in the same vein, I think that individual departments are gonna to have to take a look at themselves and the community they exist in and make sure that their standards, well, first are fair and that race, racial bias is gone. That, that just cannot be tolerated anywhere in America anymore. It's done. Um, and it's gonna be up to every single one of us every day to make sure that is the new paradigm for all of us. But in terms of um, police forces, of course we need to ban all of that kind of activity for anybody. And um, I think the governor's package is a great start and we'll move from there. And it's, again, we have to adjust to the times. And so it's, it's, it's beyond time. Okay, um, property tax is an issue that you've been well aware of for your whole legislative career. career. Um, the caps, on property tax levies for school districts, 
local governments. Um, if you're reelected, uh, would you vote to do away with them with these special circumstances like COVID or keep them in place um, with the caveat that of course referendums could allow local governments to exceed those caps? Well, to tax your community by referendum is really, especially with schools, makes no sense. It's expensive. Um, you aren't really sure that you're hearing all the voices that count. Um, that's no way to do business, to raise money to, for your schools. So yes, I think we need to lift the caps, but we need to be very careful about which ones we lift for whom. And again, COVID has created problems that we did not anticipate a year ago or 10 years ago. We're gonna have to be able to look to other sources. And I'm, I'm talking about the federal government. Um, we're gonna have to make sure that those resources are made available to our communities in ways other than taxing themselves when they don't have jobs. And you know they're, they're experiencing a lot of the same problems that the municipalities are. Where do we get the money to do what we have to do? Okay. You and I watched Milwaukee leaders come up and at that one public hearing, argue for the ability to levy a local option, additional half cent sales tax. Is it time to give local? Is it time to give local governments to to reduce their reliance on the property tax options, uh, additional revenue options like that? Maybe even broadening the five percent sales tax to some now exempt products and services to give local uh, governments more money. There's a lot that the Wisconsin legislature legislature can do in that in that realm. Um, I would begin by ending the corporate welfare taxes. When I look at how much money we spent on Foxconn, um, the manufacturing agriculture tax, the, the dark store loophole failure to close that, there's a lot we could do to help those municipalities without going to more local taxes. Um, should we allow that freedom? Maybe, I don't know. I think the jury's out on that. I, it wouldn't be my first choice. Okay. Um, we haven't not been able to find a stable source of funding for our highway system. The governor was willing to raise the gas tax. Um, are you willing to raise the gas tax uh, in the next session? I am and I have been. Um, okay. I actually had constituents say, look, gas prices are the lowest they have been in ages. Why aren't we taking advantage of that and putting in a gas tax index to um, inflation? And, and move forward with that. It's, it's ridiculous that we haven't done this in the last 10 years. And we're, we're way too low to support the highways that we want and need to keep commerce moving. So, yep, I'm there. Okay. New subject. When um, local governments authorize public works projects, should they, be re should they be required to give a preference to Wisconsin companies? And here's why I ask. A study found that in 2015, out-of-state contractors got 72 million in public works projects. That went from 72 million in 2015 to 146 million in 2018. Should local governments have to give preference to Wisconsin companies? Yes, pure and simple, yes. Okay. That money needs to recirculate in Wisconsin. Um, we need to have some absolute certainty that the people building these projects, that the um, the workers are trained and all safety standards are used. And I think we have more control over that when they are Wisconsin businesses. And of course, we want to keep um, business in Wisconsin, just like we want to keep business in America. Okay, then uh, last question. Let's talk about, um, as you know, I've interviewed your opponent in the primary and she said that legislators have played it safe on the on racial issues and the black community is in peril. So. Could I ask you to respond to that and highlight differences between you and your primary opponent, please? Well, I'll start by saying she must not have checked my record um, or checked with the uh, black legislators that I work with and I know. Yeah. It just is not true. That's not the case. Um, and yes, are, are blacks in peril in Wisconsin and America? Yes, they are. Anybody who would deny that uh, is probably part of the problem. Okay. Well, um, thoughts on how to correct some of the racial disparities in Wisconsin? Well, again, I think I, I have to go back to 
Every one of us has that responsible every day, that responsibility. We have to make sure that when people say or do things that are inappropriate or downright racist, we call them out on it. Um, it gets far more difficult when the leadership in Wisconsin, in uh, Washington is standing there, making it more difficult every day for people to do that. So, you know, it starts at the top for sure, but every one of us is responsible for fixing this problem and changing our culture going forward. Thank you. State Representative Sandy Pope of Mount Horeb is a Democratic candidate seeking re-election in the 80th Assembly District. The primary is August 11th. Sandy, thank you so much for talking to Wisconsin. You're welcome, Steve. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139.